Today is May 22nd, 2017. You're listening to Human Factors Cast, episode 43. We're covering this week's stories. Got some fun reports. Uh, if you find death and fatalities fun. From the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, we're talking about fidget toys. And uh, do we need to call for a digital Geneva convention? I don't know. We'll figure it out today. Let's do this! Human Factors Cast starts right now. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Oh, I was, I was waiting for Elise to jump in and steal my show again. Uh, she's not here this week. But welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. Yes, me and Nick back in the interwebs again for another episode of Human Factors Cast. How are you this week, Nick? Dude, I'm good. I'm good. I'm a little flustered because uh, some, some stuff pushed back our recording, and I was just so excited to talk about Human Factors that, uh, you know, anything that impedes my ability to talk about human factors with you on a Monday night really kind of gets me flustered. But I'm here. We're here. We're good. I'm I'm good. You good? Oh, I am good. And in fact, I've kind of got a little bit of fun UX news for the week. You uh, down? Oh, dude, let's hear it. All right. So I, of course, I'm a big Amazon buyer, right? So sometimes I just buy products not really knowing who they're coming from. Like if it's just if it's something I need, I cop it. So last week I got like a lens hood for my camera for shooting it like early in the morning and late at night. But I got a really sweet physical product user experience out of it. And it was I received an actual thank you letter from a company called Digital Goja. Uh, for like it was just like a cleaning cloth for my lens, which is not what I purchased. Uh, but the best part was it was very personal. It was from the president of the company, and it was actually hand signed. But not only that, and I really <laughs> encourage people to take note on this. It was it was paper, but they gave you very a very simple graphic to tell you what to what to type into YouTube to even find them and see tutorials about their product, which is just the company's name. Now, I know that seems really simple and easy, but stuff like that really makes it for me. And I remember those companies that do that kind of stuff. So so they actually hand wrote you a letter that says, go to YouTube and type in this stuff to find out how to like for tutorials on how to use our stuff. Yeah, and the the part that I guess I really liked was it was from a company that wasn't necessarily associated with the lens that I bought, right? So it was like a secondary ah. thing that they partnered with this lens company to send you their products for free. And they go a little step further, sending you like personalized notes, thanking you, telling you how to find out more about it in a pretty simple way. So, But it was for the wrong product. I mean, did you ever get the right product that you were looking for? No, yeah, yeah. So I must have misexplained. So I did get the the like lens hood, but it actually came with this in addition to it. So these two companies had partnered together, um, and the Digital Gojo is just like sending out their products for free along with. Oh, uh, oh, 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 okay, I see, I yeah. see. So it was kind of like just a free add-on that they. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's pretty cool. You got some free swag. Yep, free swag it. indeed. I dig it. What about it. you, Nick? Have you come across anything sweet this week? You know what, man? So I have been um let me let me so so back to that user experience, right? I'm gonna talk about the user experience of food. I'm a fatty man, so this is like close to home. But here's the thing. Um you know, a couple years ago I I uh I really got a hold of my life and I was able to sort of um cut weight and and sort of uh, eat healthier um, by doing a very specific diet. If any of our listeners are familiar with the ketogenic diet, it's kind of high fat, low carb, um, you know, eat lots of meat and cheese. But it, I mean, that's the perception of it. And, and meat and cheese kind of seems unhealthy at the surface. But I mean, it's much more than that. There's a lot of greens. It's a lot of like uh, broccoli and whatnot. But so uh, I, I'm really turned on by this idea of First off, the way this works on my body. But second off, uh, have you heard of this product called Soylent? Actually, Nick, you were the one that introduced me to Soylent when we were still working together. Yeah, so Soylent is, uh, for our listeners who are unfamiliar, Soylent is basically 
everything that you need to survive, to live off of, vitamins, minerals, calories, macronutrients, all that stuff in one bottle in liquid form, right? And uh, the company has various flavors and whatnot. But the idea is that you drink four of these a day, and that's literally everything that the human needs to survive. And, and you know, it's based in protein powder. But the problem I've always had with this stuff is that, uh, you know, being wanting to do the ketogenic diet, uh, the macronutrients for Soylent were not in line with what works for me. And so, um, you know, it's been very difficult because this, I love the idea of Soylent. So basically, the idea is you don't have to really make a lunch. You can just grab something and you know it's, it's like basically hacking human... Um, genetics or not genetics but you know the the way we process food and just giving us exactly what we need so anyway all this being said i have found a product that basically gives you in powder form so, so there are some very minor uh preparation for this and that was the big thing for me i was like i just want something that i can prepare but this is so easy so you basically pour in some calories through like a uh, heavy whipping cream and some water and mix it in with this protein powder that has all your stuff in it and it's low carb high fat ish um and uh it's so easy to use and i've been i've been replacing my lunches and i just have to say man like the ux of food is a real thing like i hate cooking i hate it it's just I, I don't have time for it and uh, like just to grab something and be done with it. Is, it's it's great. So that's cool. I mean, uh, funny enough, I did a run over the weekend. I was like the Navy run in San Diego and Elise actually got a bag of goodies. And one of them in there was a ketogenic uh, pre-workout supplement. So, I mean, this stuff's really getting big. And I mean, you, I really appreciate your love for the ux of food because it's something that i hold near and dear as well oh yeah yeah no it is great all right well i think we've talked enough about food and uh and free stuff and handwritten notes so let's go ahead and get into <laughs> <laughs> let's go ahead and get into that news now this could be anything from medical transportation we got a lot of that today psychology artificial intelligence virtual reality whatever it is as long as it deals with the field of human factors it's fair game. Blake, what do we have up first? All right. So up first, we're tackling the transportation world. So the AAA Foundation for Traffic Sa Safety has released a report reviewing recent U.S. research on the effectiveness of infrastructure improvements to reduce crash frequency and severity. The research estimates that the needed nationwide infrastructure and safety improvements and the potential benefits of addressing those needs for several roadway types, such as lane widening, shoulder paving, and widening alignment improvements, medium treatments, adding passing lanes, and installing rumble strips. Oh my, that is a lot of different changes to be made, but hopefully they'll reduce crash rates or severity, as they talk about. Yeah, that's a lot of stuff. Um, and, you know, I... Listen, listeners... This one's going to be rough because we do like to prepare uh, for the show. But like I said, stuff got in the way. So we're kind of going <laughs> to we're going to uh, kind of you know, wing this one a little bit. Um, the fact that these reports are coming out is very good uh, because this this report kind of goes into basically what kind of projects are going on and they're presenting the results of them in uh, such a way as like what worked and what didn't lessons learned and how can we use this to uh, alter our roads in such a way that will reduce fatalities reduce crashes um, you know and make the human pay a little bit more attention while they're on the road these types of things um, and I I wish I had highlights from these but I'm I'm just gonna pick one at random here so like they're talking about uh, you mentioned lane width and um, this is one thing that actually I I did very, very um, cursory work on this while I was still in grad school. We had a driving simulator and, um, you know, we, we were able to manipulate the, the lane sizes as well as the line widths um, and lengths to see what kind of effect they were having on the drivers. And um, apparently so, like yeah. at a high level, what did you see when? you would do that like if you wind a lane what was the big effect 
Well, if you widen the lane, um, if you think about it, your global optical flow rate is not... It, it doesn't look like you're going as fast because the lanes are uh, wider. Um, but there's there's a careful balance that you have to strike because if you make them too thin, then people are merging out of the lanes, in and out of the lanes, um, because it takes a lot of focus to concentrate. So, And you don't want that just that tracking task of being within those lanes to be your primary task. You want to be paying attention to what's going on around you. So it's a very delicate balance of how close do you put these lanes together you know, enough to make them feel like, oh, maybe they're going too fast, so they should slow down. And also, um, you know, how, how do you not make them close enough together to where they are not just paying attention to the tracking task in front of them, trying to stay between these lines, and, you know, to where they're paying attention to the things around you. It's it's a really interesting problem, and I, I cannot wait to dig into this thing. Um, again, I apologize for our lack of preparation but i promise we will make it up with the the next stories uh blake let's go ahead and move on to the next one because it is also traffic related and we do have some prep work for this one got you i just want to throw one little quick thing in there i mean oh the, yeah sure sorry part about I totally, a good part <laughs> <laughs> i totally yeah th this is what i think blake next story Keep Sorry. going, fool. Keep going. Okay, so here's kind of what I see from looking at this. I mean, yeah, Nick is right. We would like to dig in a little more, but the implications of this information being released and then them talking about like literal, I think it's, we list at least six things that they are talking about you can do to help re reduce frequency of crashes and severity. And well, that was, that was the if, short list too. That was the yeah, short list. Yeah, that's, that's the small list. But the good thing is, is one, data is being collected on this. So... You could apply this in a way of let's take a look at, okay, this is the U.S. Well, do, do places like the U.K. or Ireland or out or the EU and outside of the EU, do they gather similar information? Because I know the roads are very different. They t excuse me, they tend to have kind of more narrow lanes. So comparison between countries might help come with a consensus of, okay, this might be the best way to make these roads or make the adjustments necessary by doing some kind of combo. And the good thing about having all of this information as far as like crash and severity rate and understanding the problems with the roads is I think this paves a good way for really understanding what you need to be paying attention to as far as developing AI in cars or autonomous cars. Like knowing, okay, these are the problems that often happen. Like you have shoulders that aren't open or alignment needs to be improved or medians are really small and you can help kind of give a baseline for different countries in programming so i i don't know there's large region implications i agree with nick we'd like digging this more but the next story really kind of takes it away hang on before you go there uh yeah. speaking of autonomous vehicles did you see that twitch is using uh grand theft auto 5 i think to um program an artificial intelligence to drive within its its uh environment no, I did not, but that sounds really incredible. It's really fun. So you can actually go and watch an AI learn how to drive in the streets. And I saw a screenshot where it was just in the middle of the ocean. So, you know, take that as you will. Computers can take a while to learn. But it it's pretty fun to sit there and just watch the thing go, oh, I need to take a left turn. And, oh, there's a person there, <laughs> not to hit the person. So, um, yeah, go check that out to any of our listeners who are interested in autonomous vehicles. Uh, all right, let's move on to the next one now. <laughs> All right. Uh, so the U.S. National Highway Traffic Safety Administration released reports that details distracting distraction affected crashes and the numbers of traffic fatalities between rural and urban areas in 2015. The reports examined the crash numbers by severity, the age of the driver and whether a cell phone was involved. All right, Nick. So it's up to you and me. We're going to break this down for the listeners. All right. Let's do it. Um, so I, I figure we just read these bullet points and uh, kind of discuss them. Should we read them all first and then discuss them, or should we read them? Yeah, let's read through and kind of get a sense okay. uh, of what's going on here as far as the data. All right, sure. So this was for 2015, as you said. Um, and uh, Okay, so 10% of fatal crashes, 15% of injury crashes, and 14% of all police-reported motor vehicle traffic crashes in 2015 were, were reported as distraction-affected crashes. Uh, in 2015, there were 3,477 people killed. I, I sound so cheerful. Um, <laughs> and an estimated additional 391,000 injured in motor vehicle crashes involving distracted drivers. 9% of all drivers has the largest affected crashes. 
Um, there were 32,166 a lot of dead people. Bruce Willis uh, must not be lonely. Uh, of these, well, I was, uh, this is these are people's lives that we're talking about here. Uh, of these 32,100, 2,500, roughly 8% that occurred in unknown areas um, t- to determine if the crashes were inside or outside the urban boundaries. Uh, of these, 7% in unknown areas, and uh, according to the 25th Community Survey from the U.S. Census Bureau, an estimated 90% of the U.S. population lived in rural areas. However, rural fatality... All right, let's break these down, man. That is just... But obviously, the big takeaway here is distracted driving is very dangerous. Now, they, they talk about distracted driving, and then they specifically talk a little bit about specifically cell phones. So distracted could be really anything in the car, just that kind of stuff. But yeah. also oh, take into account that cell phone usage accounts for a lot of these deaths. I got it. Here you go. Th- this is from the actual rep- uh, A distraction-affected crash is identified as distracted at the time of the crash. Gotcha. Very <laughs> good. Nice operational definition. <laughs> pretty pretty operational. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, so that could be, um, that could be anything, right? That could be cell phones. That could be passengers. That could be um, looking at a cow on the side of the road or a billboard or whatever, depending on whatever you're, you're in. So um, as far as... They also have some examples here, cell phone use, texting. Uh, it also includes other activities such as e-radio or climate controls. So it could be any of those things. So, Nick, what I find out for me from these numbers, and I, I'm i trying to think of a reason for why this is, but it's are occurring at not extremely higher rates, but at a higher percentage in rural areas than urban. And for some reason, I would have expect the opposite. So it, it have you lived in an, uh, in a rural area before? Yeah, I've lived both in the outskirts of Alabama and in, I don't know, the middle of Long Beach. And I I don't know. I feel like there's more cars per square mile in a city, and there's definitely people, you know, more likely to be distracted driving. There are. Um, so, so here's my initial thought on it, and I have not even dug into their analysis bit on this. Um, but I believe, I believe part of the reasoning is that in the city— you may not be traveling as fast, and so crashes may not be as fatal if you were distracted. Like, yes, there's a higher base rate of distracted driving in the city, but because the speeds are more in traffic or when you are, you know, uh, in an intersection, potentially, it might not be fatal. Um, likewise, you get the uh, the people who love to joyride in the country— and, um, you know, they go fast and there's like living in Idaho, there were hills and dangerous slopes everywhere. And, you know, one one wrong move and you were off the side of a cliff. And uh, I think a lot of that is where uh, these statistics come from. I, and, you know, I mean, the numbers show that. I mean, when we're talking about of about like 33,000 fatal crashes. We're looking at 48% being in rural, like you're talking about, and then 45% in urban areas. And I think your explanation of traffic and going slower, that makes a lot of sense, uh, especially in this case. Yeah, and like I said, I don't, I'm not an expert on this, so I I couldn't tell you for sure. Um, And obviously, uh, you know, you can't just break it down to those two factors. There's a ton of things that they collect data on for these reports. So, um, yeah, it, it's unfair for me to just kind of say, yeah, this cursory glance is why, um, why that is. Yeah. And I feel like there's a bunch of extra variables to think about. Like, did they have a seatbelt on? Did they have something wrong with the car prior? Is that why there was right. a fatal accident? Or was it all because they were distracted? How did they always qualify that somebody was distracted? It's there's a lot of different like ins and outs that could apply to why these things are actually happening. But it's it's obvious that the correlation does exist between okay, there's a problem with being distracted while you're driving and then getting in more accidents at the yeah. very least. You know what? Looking at this report, it almost seems like there are there is no analysis piece. It's literally just raw data and it's it's explaining it. There's no analysis on it like we believe that this is because of this. It's all just this happened, this happened, this happened. Here are the raw data. And then, you know, from that, 
us scientists, we can we can go in and basically say it could be because of this. But uh, yeah, and I I remember taking an attention class specifically, and this is really what we talked about a bunch of times was either studies that had to do with kind of what you were talking about earlier, like changes in lane length width all of those kind of variables and then adding in where they distracted along with just raw data like this and what the trends you kind of see. So I'm again, kind of like the first story. I'm just glad this information is available and obviously logged somewhere that can be maybe useful to either other countries or our own like algorithms that are, can use it as like a learning base. Yeah. And, and uh, you know what, if you don't have any other closing thoughts on this, I think this is a really good segue to go into our next story. hundred percent, man. Let's do it. All right. So traveling through unfamiliar territory can be tough and sometimes turn by turn navigation just doesn't cut it. But fear not, because a new design update from Google Maps is here to help. So Google quietly rolled out a new design update, adding visual cues in the form of street view images of every road you need to turn on while you're going from point A to point B. From now for now, the new update to Google Maps is only available for Android users, but it will be rolling out later for iPhone users. So, Nick, I'm interested to see, or to, sorry, <laughs> I'm interested to hear your take on this because I, I feel like I have a strong opinion about it, whether it's useful or not. Do you see this? This is this is my opinion. Do you see it? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I, I I was focusing on you saying. I'm interested to see. What, what, sorry, what was your uh, question? <laughs> uh, I wanted to see your take on it and how you, well you thought this. So, I mean, it depends on uh, it depends uh, on how this is implemented. So, I actually tried this this weekend, and my phone uh, was not updated. See, we do try these things for you guys. There are some preparation things we do for this show. It's not like we just do this willy nilly. Um, I mean, damn, I brought bought a fidget spinner for Christ's sake, uh, which we'll talk about later, but. Uh, yeah, no, I was unable to see what they were talking about here, but, um, to my understanding, the gist of it is that while you're navigating, it will basically show you, um, a street view image of where you're supposed to turn. And it depends on how you use your navigation. Like for me, um, I just kind of glance at it and I'm, I'm very much, uh, my mental model is, is maps and, uh, especially living in Southern California, I kind of memorize maps from the top down and I'm able to navigate in 3D space according to that 2D top down view. Um, so I don't I don't really know that this would help somebody like me, but somebody who's very visual in learning and directions uh, that are based on landmark effects, I, I feel like this could be very beneficial to someone who processes information in that way. Ah, so this this is kind of a fun dichotomy then, because here here's where I where I kind of jumped on it was I think it it's useful, like you said, for people that are using it as a visual aid. But I often find myself, and this could be an artifact of me not having a mount in my car for my phone. Um, but I try not to really touch my phone while I'm in the car. But I will use my navigation and I'll try and listen to it. And the biggest problem I found with Google Maps and really any other service, Apple Maps, Waze, is that its verbal cues are just not on point enough in terms of proximity of when to make a turn. That I would rather see something updated in terms of that, uh, Vice giving you like an actual picture of the street. Um, But again, you make a good point. People learn differently and are better facilitated at picking up directions depending on how what mode they like to learn from be it visual or auditory or a combination of both right i mean so to go with your i i think it's it's worth checking out so you, you said that you listen to directions rather than look at them and i think this could be applied in that way too right like make a right after the um after the dominoes on the corner and <laughs> this episode of human factors cast brought to you by dominoes uh you know like so it could do landmarks as well just auditorily right um and i uh, the problem i find with my audio at least is that one it interrupts me from listening to my music or other podcasts such as human factors cast in the car uh and so uh i don't i don't use the audio i mute it and i have it in my periphery 
but for someone like you, I think they they could still do that whole landmark thing for audio as well. And I, I think it really comes down to the mental model of how you process information with regards where with respect to directions. So. Yeah, and I think you're right. I mean, it ultimately comes down to what you prefer. Um, and I, f- I feel like it would be a lot more work going the audio route because you're going to have to pick very specific landmarks or if there's not one, what do you do? How do you qualify it? But still, I mean, I think it's a good addition. Uh, I, when it rolls on an iPhone, I'll have a better opinion about it. But uh, I mean, it can't hurt. I think anything that's going to make it a little more accurate is going to be helpful to people. Yeah, for sure. For sure. All right. What do we got up next? All right, so sticking in the world of cars, so people form intimate connections to their cars, especially here in California. During the course of our day, we'll have a daily commute, maybe sit in some frustrating traffic jams, Uh. or even go on a liberating road trip. But what if your car knew detailed information about your insides, such as the regularity of your heartbeat or the amount of glucose in your blood? How, then, might you feel about your car? Well, Ford is experimenting with a gamut of health and wellness features for its cars and SUVs. And according to one of Ford's R&D leaders, quote, we've seen consumer spending on health and wellness go up strongly. So this trend in customer spending has motivated Ford to work on these health features for its cars in hopes that it will excite customers and give it an edge in the competitive automotive market. Now, I'm kind of excited about this because we've gone over a bunch of stories recently and i know last week we hit on that apple's watch is very accurate in determining um abnormal heartbeat so having this kind of like monitoring you all the time from a secondary point of view i think would be pretty cool yeah i mean we talked a lot about health stuff last week with elise on the show and um for for me I spend like three hours in the car each day. So how much data would Ford have on my sedentary habits where I just sit? Um, But also, you know, with with great data comes great responsibility. And also with great data comes the ability to potentially uh, protect me against risky situations. If the car was able to say, look, get out of the car, your blood pressure is high, you're sitting in traffic, you are... um, you know, you're, you're not doing okay. Get out, get some air. Um, or, or likewise, you know, if you're going on a long road trip, something like this would be great. Also, if you're able to track trends, you might be able to, like we were saying the other day, the, the iPhone or the Apple watch was able to detect abnormal heartbeats within, um, 97% of the time, whatever that was. Uh, So, I mean, the, the fact that we're now starting to do something about data, this excites me. But I'm also kind of bummed that it's just Ford right now. <laughs> I well, guess. I mean, the good uh, part the future, about that is yeah. right. They're gonna they're gonna increase competition. So if For Ford sure. starts doing it, Toyota will get into it, and then it'll just trickle down. See, though, here's the thing, though. I don't. Okay, so I'm I'm putting myself in the mindset of a new car buyer. I just bought a brand new car um, a year ago, and I'm I'm trying to put myself into that position. If I were to go ahead and purchase a new car, would this be something that I would be interested in? And it, it all comes down to cost, right? Like if it's going to cost me $100 extra, fine. But likely it will cost something like $3,000 extra uh, for a health suite. Um, you know, you know, these are just two sensors. I'm thinking long term. So a health suite costs you $3,000, but you know exactly what... Uh, is going on with your body while you are in the car. And for me, I like I, I like tracking as much about myself as I can, even if I do nothing about it. Um, I, I think we talked about this with fitness trackers, right? I have a fitness tracker on, uh, and I've been a little bit better about it recently, but, you know, I, there was a long period of my life where I did nothing. I just, I just used it as a watch. But I have that data, and I can go back, and I can look and say, wow, I did nothing. I I made no steps that day. So for me, I think maybe it would be worth it. Yeah, it excites me. It excites me. Yeah, I still on the same lines as you. Uh, I think showing the utility of it, like with somebody like Ford launching it and then maybe demonstrating what they can do with the data, that's going to be the real tell whether car manufacturers just make it something that comes in cars and it's like cuts the cost out of it. 
Right. Um, because I mean, it's all going to depend on how it's used. But I, I agree with you. It's it's exciting, cool little step in the way forward. What uh, what kind of things are you thinking this would be able to do? Like I, like I, I said, uh, you know, it could motivate you to get out of traffic and get some air or um so i've got a a kind of completely different take and let's let's say that this catches on to the point where like like i was talking about that car manufacturers they just build it in the cars there's not really the cost is built in of course but it's not like hey you're getting a health suite for 3k because what if your car is taking measurements on you maybe blood glucose and a combination of how your heart rhythm is changing and that's coordinate that's kind of coordinating with your Fitbit and maybe it's able to analyze when you're maybe a bit inebriated and it can stop you from driving the car based off of your heartbeat, how elevated your blood glucose might be. Um, Maybe if it gets a little more intense uh, watching how you make movements, are your movements very jerky? So I think there's farther reaching implications than just knowing data about yourself. I think this steps into the world of continuing to build smart cars. That is a great one to end on. Uh, well, not not stories. Take a round because we're still talking about stories. But uh, oh I mean, yeah, I mean, that's fact, a great... dude. This, this next one, one is so cool. This one's so cool. I love this. Uh, this is gonna make you a superhuman in a hurry. So Lowe's is testing out the use of exoskeletons for their store staff so that they can fetch you that giant bucket of paint off the top shelf. So Lowe's is partnered with Virginia Tech to test prototype passive exoskeletons that can make it easier to haul heavy objects. The suit's back and legs are made of carbon fiber that act as a taut bow, storing energy when you bend down, and that energy comes back when you stand up. This helps to make it easier when you're lifting something heavy like a bag of concrete. So the exoskeleton materials are built to be comfortable, which is important for warehouse workers who will need to wear them through an entire work shift. And as a beta test, four suits are being used at a store in Virginia. It will be months before Lowe's and Virginia Tech have enough information to understand the longer-term effects of the exoskeleton, but if deemed trustworthy, you may see these deployed across Lowe's locations. Now, Nick, this is really, really cool, but I've got some <laughs> problems with it. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. What are your problems? I want to hear your problems before I jump into this. Okay, now, I've never seen this thing. It's coming from a university. There's likely people that are involved that are making sure this is not the case. But based off of the picture they show with somebody bending down, it does not support good functional movement for your back. It's actually having you round a lot more than you would need to. Like, think of, I don't know, listeners, think of if as if you've ever done a deadlift, which you do like a hinge from your hip and you keep your back rather flat instead of rounding it forward, which when you lift something heavy is likely to hurt your lower back because you're using too much of your lower back muscles. So then again, this is based off of a picture, not necessarily the research I have from Virginia Tech or anything like that. So that was kind of what was worrying me a little bit about it. Do me a favor, Blake. Watch the video because, I mean, that that comes down to training. Um, I, I, I hear you. I hear you. But the people in the video, uh, the people in the video are um, – completely able to adjust their back in ways that would be the appropriate lifting um, posture. If you watch this video, they are able to, I mean, I, I think about it this way. Like they are lifting things that would otherwise be unsafe to lift uh, or, or very stressful to lift. Um, and look, man, I'm speaking from experience. I worked at Home Depot and, and lifting like 500 what are those bricks i forget what they're called pavers uh into the back of somebody's car over and over yes, like you said a lot of it comes down to posture but if you watch this video they are completely able to um manipulate their posture in um a, uh, the appropriate ways and they actually make a point to say that it is free enough so they can move their arms it's free enough so that you, you know, they can straighten their back. Um, they can do all these things and uh, it, it still provides support. Yeah. And I, I think your experience kind of speaks to the need for this, right? Like if you're lifting oh something God, so yeah. heavy so many times over and over, if this thing's supporting you, even if you have great posture, at some point you get fatigued during an eight hour shift, right? So if this is oh, helping yeah. that, I'm all for it. And I hope the data shows that it is something that should be deployed across stores. 
Yeah, I'm really bummed. We were uh, we were trying to get Woodrow, our ergonomics guy, on the show this week, and uh, he had something come up last minute. So if you're out there, let him know that you want him on the show, and uh, you know we'll try to get him on next week and and talk a little bit about this then. But yeah, this is very similar to something that um, you know in the military they have something like this as well. Uh, and I just I love the fact that you know. We understand that we, as humans, can't functionally lift things that are heavy without stressing the body. And any help is welcome help. Um, But, yeah, special shout-out to any of our uh, Virginia Tech listeners who are listening and who have worked on this project. Please send us a line if you are um, a student or a uh, professor, researcher working on this project. We'd love to hear from you. This This is awesome work. Most definitely. All right, Nick, you ready to move? I'm I'm ready to spin into the oh, next story. Oh! <laughs> All right, well, everybody, get ready to spin because we're talking about the fidget spinner. Oh. All right, so fidget spinner craze has been sweeping elementary and middle school students. In fact, the toy has been in the top 10 selling toys list on Amazon. However, further research has showed that these toys might not just be a fad. In fact, they may have practical use for adults. Researchers from UC Davis found that letting kids with ADHD fidget while they were trying to complete a cognitively demanding task did improve performance on the task. However, like most things in science, there is a debate as to whether these fidget toys are actually a nuisance or that they can provide some people with the optimal level of stimulation for focus. You see some teachers have banned them from their classrooms and even some other experts have challenge the idea that fidgeting is good for ADHD or anxiety. Meanwhile, Kickstarter for the Fidget Cube, another fidget toy, has raised more than $6.4 million and can be seen on the desks of techies across the globe. Now, this is a fun one for me because I love it when there's a debate in the science. Yeah. I what what is what are your thoughts on this stuff? Like do you think it works first off? So so personally, I find great benefit from it. I don't, well, I'm not going to say I don't have ADHD. I don't know if I have ADHD, but I definitely experience a heavy amount of anxiety, especially when I'm getting towards deadlines or I'm just kind of nervous about something that I'm working on. And I'm a big proponent of keeping a Rubik's Cube near me on my desk, in my backpack, in my car to help me kind of like, you know, break the pattern of the way I'm thinking. Think about something else for a minute and then come back to my problem maybe with a a little more clarity. But what I've actually found is like things like Rubik's cubes can be kind of loud. So something like the fidget cube or even the spinner, I think would be better because it has less noise associated with it. And it wouldn't bother people around me as much. Sure. So look, here's the thing. I was, I, I, and I still am a little bit, I'm kind of, I'm glad that we're at odds on this because I'm still a little skeptical. Uh, and, and I actually, purchased a fidget spinner for the purpose of the show uh you're welcome listeners and (laughs) i uh i started playing with it so i got it on friday i think i started playing with this thing and um i don't i i don't find a level of zen i guess but it is nice i guess it's nice to have something to like just play with your hands with when you're thinking about something or when you just kind of want to zone out and do something with your hands. I was talking with a coworker today and and they were saying that they uh, were thinking about a fidget toy in order to reduce, you know, them biting their nails in order to, uh, because of anxiety or whatever. So I, I can't personally speak that this has helped me, but I am totally okay with anecdotal evidence in this case. Like, do what works for you. That has always been kind of my motto. Do what works for you. Um, And uh, it's important to note that, yeah, you brought up that UC Davis study, but there has not been uh, research specifically conducted, as far as I know, on fidget spinners or fidget toys um, and, and whether or not they have an effect. The, the study that from uh, UC Davis was kind of looking at um, just fidgeting in general, right? Yeah, precisely. And I mean, you even see that with studies related to standing desks, like giving people the ability to kind of like move their legs or fidget around and improvement in performance. So, but yeah, I'm glad you pointed that out. Nothing specifically has been done with the fidget spinner itself, 
Um, and I totally agree with Nick. This is a very case by case thing. I think, I think if, if this works for you, do it. If not, there's always got to be something else out there for you now to play devil's advocate on that. So I bought the fidget, fidget, fidget skinner. Can you imagine a skinner box that you play with? Um, I bought the fidget spinner. I did not buy the fidget cube. And I feel that the fidget cube may be more up my alley because I frequently find myself clicking my pin at work. And, uh, you know, I'm sure the people I share my office with are, are love that. Uh, but I, I frequently click my pin. And the fidget cube has buttons that you can push. And I'm wondering if that would help me better because it, it has a variety of different ways to interact. And I think maybe because the fidget spinner is limited to like one or two forms of interaction where you either flick it or spin it with your other hand, I, I feel like that may be limiting my ability to appreciate it and use it as a tool. So with that said, I have a fidget spinner for one of our lucky listeners uh, just be sure to write into Human Factors Cast and let us know what you like about the show. Post a picture of your review. See what I'm doing? I'm having you review. It's not extortion, is it? Is this extortion? I don't know. Review incentive. us. Incentive. <laughs> it's incentive. Give us a review on iTunes, Google Play, whatever. We're all over the place. Send us a picture of that review, and I will send you out my fidget spinner. It looks very Batman-y. It's kind of cool. Um all right. With that said, let's move on to the next one. Uh, actually, before we move on to the next one, I want to make a big thank you to all our friends over at TechCrunch, Science Daily, Spectrum IEEE, Scientific American, Transportation Research Board, and Engadget for bringing us our stories this week. If you want to follow along to all these stories as we find out about them, be sure to follow us on all our social media. Uh, we have been interacting with some of you, and it's been phenomenal. I've heard some really great feedback about us posting this uh, these stories, and uh, it, it's great that you guys can follow along as well. All right, Blake, let's go ahead and move on to the next one. Yeah, let's get into it. All right, so a ransomware exploit you might have heard of, heard of called WannaCry has spe- spread across 150 countries on over 200,000 machines, and the blame is spreading just as rapidly. Microsoft is, itself is calling for the Digital Geneva Convention to limit future cyber attacks like WannaCry. Although Microsoft released a security patch in March that closes the WannaCry and WannaCrypt hole, Unsupported versions of Windows, including Windows XP, are still vulnerable. Further, some of the blame has even been pushed off onto the NSA for stockpiling system vulnerabilities without reporting them, which may have led to the may have allowed for extortion by hackers. Regardless of where the blame actually lies, Microsoft is making a great point that we do need a convention that will call on the world's governments to pledge that they will not engage in cyber attacks on on the private sector, that they will not target civilian infrastructure, but instead they will work with the private sector to respond to vulnerabilities. Now, Nick, this one has a lot of far-reaching implications because it's, uh, it's messing with a lot of different people and talking about basically your computer being opened up and the the ability of the private sector to only do so much as they learn information and then perhaps the government knows more than anybody else is getting let in on. This just has a lot of problems associated with it. With the Geneva Convention or the cybersecurity aspect itself? The cybersecurity aspect of it. Okay, yeah, because I was going to say, so there, like, I yes, this this attack was on computers. And while, yes, computers are the uh, sort of central tool in which we utilize for our day-to-day jobs, there are other cybersecurity concerns that maybe, you know, the average person wouldn't think about. Um, for example, I worked at a uh, an electrical relay company that took cybersecurity very seriously because... If somebody were to able to hack the infrastructure involved with the electrical power grid, that would cause serious damage. Think about it. Hospitals not having power. Um, the military not having power. Every every person on the on the, in the country not having power. Uh, think about just think about the far reaching um, implications of that. So there and and. That's I only know about that because I worked in the industry for a little bit. 
who knows what other things are out there that you could hack that would have devastating impacts on the entire country, right? So, uh, like, like shipping uh, manifests and shipping lanes and, and causing people to crash in, in autonomous vehicles or, or just any of these things. So, basically, uh, yes, I'm down for the Digital Geneva Convention. <laughs> Yeah, and I think it's it's important they to kind of iron out. Like I understand government wanting to stockpile system vulnerabilities for their own use, but making sure that the private sector is at least clued in on them in such a way that they have the information when it's necessary, kind of before something like this happens. Now and again, it's hard to predict based on what you, what system vulnerabilities you know which ones will be accessed because hopefully they're under lock and key. But things like this do happen. Actually, you know what? We should probably back up. For any of our listeners who don't know what the Geneva Convention is, uh, it's possible that we have listeners that don't know what it is. It's basically an agreement uh, across countries that says we will not use this form of uh, attack or uh, um, I don't know what else to call it. It's basically saying it's an agreement that's it's what we use for biochemical warfare. Like we won't use this if you won't use this. Um, because it could really, really mess things up otherwise. So for them to call a digital Geneva Convention where you're basically taking into consideration cybersecurity, I think this is completely called for, and uh, I would I would love to see this happen before my prediction comes true. <laughs> you and me both, man. You and me both. All right, let's move on to the next one. All right. So my favorite segment of the show is when we get to talk about Alexa. But anyway... So Amazon is adding notifications to its Alexa service so that skills can provide you with information as it becomes available. These notifications will be unprompted as opposed to the, the usual in response to user questions prompts. So initially, this capability is going to be rolled out to a small number of select partners, including AccuWeather, The Washington Post, Just Eat, and Life360. There will also be a developer preview coming soon to allow skill, skill makers to test the functionality in their own products. Notifications are going to be provided in a bunch of different modalities, specifically including an audible chime and a pausing green light using the LED ring on the Echo, Echo Dot, and Echo Show hardware. Further, users can ask Alexa, what did I miss to find out what specific, specific information has been coming in or turn on a do not disturb mode if they'd like to suspend all notifications for a set time. Now, Nick, you are my resident expert on all things Alexa. How does this impact you? Well, let me back up a second because some of our listeners may have noticed that there's been a lack of Amazon news, and that's for a reason. I always try to make these stories when I select them um, relate to human factors. And, uh, you know, some of the some of the Amazon news has been, oh, well, they're coming out with a new Echo and they're coming out with a new in-home device. And it just wasn't newsworthy. This is newsworthy. And let me tell you why. This is one step closer to humans interacting with their home. Now, instead of just telling a computer what to do, that computer is now... Uh, responding to prompts in a system and informing the user based on what their preferences are. So, for example, I order a package from Amazon, and because there is the whole Amazon ecosystem built into Alexa, uh, I can set it up to where Alexa can tell me, you have a new package notification, right? I, it, p mail's not always delivered at the same time here uh, where I live. And so... It's it, it can be disheartening to go out and not see a package and then uh, have to come back in. But if I have her go, you know, as soon as because Amazon gets those updates. So push it to Alexa. Get me to know exactly when it's there so I don't waste my time. Likewise, this could be useful for other things. Like if you have integration with the smart home, somebody rings the doorbell, you get Alexa to say, here's and especially with the new uh, Alexa video a picture of the person, send it to the thing, and just say, hey, there's somebody's at the door, and then it's a picture of them. So there's several different ways that this could be really, really beneficial to improving people's lives, and that's kind of my thoughts on it. But I want to know, would you want passive notifications in your home? It's kind of like, uh, from from my perspective, it's kind of like um, uh, uh, on your phone, those notifications that come down, 
But I mean, would you want to know when your dinner's done cooking, when the timer hits zero? Would you want to know um, all these other, like, I, I'm leading you, obviously. Well, I mean, here's one. the things I would actually be interested in. I mean, I do like the idea that it's basically notifications like you would get on your phone, and that's kind of cool. But what I really think would be great is if they're if they're tying it to things like you were talking about with packages or your buying habits, asking you questions like if you need something or if your house as a whole is detected and can plug into the system that, hey, somebody's at the door like you were talking about. Uh, but I – my favorite part about this is that they're doing it. They're implementing it. Actually, I got two things for you. Um, but I like that they're dropping it out for developers to play with and allow it to try and pull this into their products. Because the more I think that we have people doing it like on their own, trying to include all this smart technology into different products, be it apps, physical products, anything like that, I think the better the tech's going to get. But my favorite feature is if I walked in my house and I had to get something done only at a specific amount of time. I could put this thing on do not disturb. And then after that, go back and say, hey, did I miss anything? What's been going on? Or get updates based on what I wanted to know. So I, I think it's a cool feature. Right. Yeah. And, um, you know, another thing I would uh, I would really appreciate is if Alexa was integrated with my Fitbit, which it is. And I can ask Fitbit how I'm doing today. And it will tell me. But what if... You know, if, if it was a specific time of day and I haven't gotten my steps in, if it says, hey, get up and move, that might be a good uh, a good use as well. So now that I really, really like. So I agree for with you 100 percent on that one. All right. What do we got? One more story. Yeah. One more. All right. Let's all right. round it out. Let's do it. All right. So the emergence of crowdfunding platforms has drastically changed how the creative process of ID generation, idea generation or ideation works. However, the sheer number of ideas that come through in crowdsourcing can be overwhelming to the ideators themselves. Well, a trio of researchers have partnered together to enhance how crowdsourcing platforms work by testing whether adding peripheral micro tasks to the ideation process can alter systems from passive to active forms of inspiration, resulting in stronger ideation sessions. The researchers found that two factors, time for ideation and productivity of the ideator, impacted the breadth of the ideas generated. Their research supports that adding these kinds of peripheral micro tasks, such as rating or comparing ideas into the process of ideation, might be helpful for both generating ideas and converging on the best ones. Now, Nick, this has really blown me away that this idea of the platform of crowdsourcing has reached into the research world and that people are trying to look at, okay, this is an awesome platform, but how do we fine tune it so that we get the most out of it? Yeah. Um, I am looking for a website right now because I've used something very similar. So, when I was A-B testing products, I was testing very micro interaction things, and I literally put them up on this website. God, I, I wish I knew it because I'd give them a shout-out. But anyway, there's a website that you can upload. And I was looking for feedback on something very, very small, right? But um, A-B testing is one thing where um, I think it's Usability Hub. It might be Usability Hub. Hang on, let me... I'm I'm looking it up right now cuz I <laughs> I want to make sure they get their uh their credit. Um yes, it was Usability Hub. So I used Usability Hub uh free plug to basically AB test and they would give me uh feedback as to um you know which which design was better and also they were able to um provide feedback on it. And this is a little different. They're basically saying um we need a solution to this. What do you think versus which one do you prefer? Uh, and I, I like that kind of approach. It's almost like uh, taking taking ideas from people and calling them your own. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. Yeah. I mean, I think it makes sense, though, because you're, you're changing this kind of passive, just chucking ideas out into a more active, let's really think about it, let's understand the other ideas are out there, how can I expand upon them? So I, th right. I think the research is interesting, but... I, I don't know. It needs maybe to go a step further or I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm just not totally sold that this is the best method because I've, I've heard no. of the product you've used before and I feel like there's more that are out there that help you with this. 
Um, so, yes. well, I'm kind of I'm kind of torn. I'd like to see where all this kind of goes. I have I have one major problem with this. Who is the sample? Who who is going to spend their time going on to others uh, other people's things and commenting on them? Right. That's my big problem. Here's my big solution to that is what if you had a company uh, like like Pacific Science and Engineering is a good example of this where we work on many different projects and some people from one project may not even be exposed to another project. But say Pacific Science and Engineering went and they allotted two hours a month and said, look, you have two hours. We have... Um, Whenever you need feedback on something, you put it into a pool, and for those two hours each month, you just you you sort through this pool and you connect what's going on on those projects to other projects, and then you build these connections. I, I can see it being useful in a context like that where everybody in the building may have some idea of what's going on or what the project's about, but they're not fully in on it, but when they just need to you know, sort of solicit feedback from others. I mean, this could also work in a big industry setting, like, hey, we're thinking about going this direction. What do you think? And then they get all this feedback, right? So I I can see it being useful for, uh, like, in-group types of things where it's almost required to get that feedback, but I don't know, man. I don't know. I'm still, I'm, I'm still really confused about what the hell these peripheral micro-tasks are. Yeah, I mean, they're very, I think it was only just rating how you, what you thought about the idea, comparing different ideas together. It was just trying to get you more involved in the entire process versus just like giving your idea out. Ah. So right. not a, not a whole like lot of, lot to say about micro tasking specifically, but I, I think that crowdsourcing, it, it could eventually help if you have people a little more paying attention versus just like chucking ideas out, leaving it for people to figure out like, oh, I have to go through 10,000 emails of ideas I got. All right. Well, I got nothing else to say on that one. You good? I'm good. All right. Let's go ahead and close out. That's going to be it for today, everyone. If you have any suggestions for any news stories that you think we may have missed, please Follow us on social media and let us know. Head on over to the Human Factors Cast, LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter. At Human Factors, er, sorry, <laughs> we're not at Human Factors Cast. Someone, that was taken. No, it's too long. Uh, at we're, we're on Twitter. Wow, this is bad. We're on Twitter at H Factors Podcast. You can join the discussion on our SoundCloud or send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com. Leave us a voicemail at 901-646-1HFC. That's 901-646-1432. If you like what we're doing, we bring these things to you ad-free except for dominoes. You can visit us on our Patreon at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. We always love it when you support us financially. Uh, be sure to like, subscribe, review us on the Apple Podcast, uh, Google Play Store, or whatever your favorite podcast directory is. If you do review us, please take a screenshot, send it to us. You might be able to win my fidget spinner. And, of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. I want to thank Mr. Blake Arnsdorf for being on the show breaking these stories down with me this week blake where can they find you as always guys you can find me at don't panic ux don't be afraid to send me a tweet on the twit twits as for me i've been your host nick rome you can find me on linkedin or twitter at nick underscore rome thanks again for tuning in to human factors cast until next time it, it depends. depends it depends on stuff and like all that all the geneva convention geneva transportation